Hello YouTube! Today we're doing a get to know me video. It's weird because I've been on the internet since 2016 in different forms and different levels of following and such, but I've never introduced myself properly. You know, when you follow someone, you slowly start to learn about their life or you kind of scroll through and learn about their past. But I've never properly explained how I got here, living in New York, graduating college, running a meme page, working for Hoka. And so today's video will be us getting to know each other. So sit down, grab a little kombucha or a coffee or something like that, and let's do a get to know me video. I asked on Instagram, get to know me questions, and I'll be going through them, you know, cutting out repeats and stuff like that. So before I get into the questions, I'm gonna do a little explaining of myself, I've decided. So hello, if you don't know me, my name's Kate Glavin. I'm 24 years old and I currently live in New York City. Born and raised in Minnesota, grew up there in a suburb, not on a farm, like a lot of people in New York don't meet people from the Midwest. And so they ask like, did you grow up on a tractor? And the answer is no. My mom grew up on a farm, but I didn't. I just grew up in a suburb. So grew up, twin brother, older sister, a lot of cats in the house, had a lot of memories in the snow, had a really good childhood, dancing, singing, all that stuff. Learned a lot in my childhood from the sense of I have a twin brother with disabilities. So I was fluent in sign language for a little bit of my childhood. Um, and especially since he was a twin, that really affected how I was raised just because we were at the same grade level and so my parents could kind of keep a baseline of how my brother was performing and stuff. And if I could walk and he couldn't, if I could talk at this age and he couldn't yet, they had to adjust and learned a lot about how fucked up the medical system is and healthcare system is and how you really have to advocate for yourself in terms of disability accommodations all throughout schooling and different clubs and extracurriculars and the college process and now him transitioning into adulthood and getting his first big time job. I played volleyball my whole life. My mom is a volleyball coach and runs a facility. My older sister played as well. So that was a huge chunk of my life. The gym felt like the second home. Whenever we get around and watch the old home videos, I was always in front of the camera, like crazy dancing. Like, dad, film me, watch me do this thing. Singing, you know, somewhere over the rainbow with my face this close to the TV because I was obsessed with Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. As I got a little bit older, I was a very academic, perfectionist kid took AP classes, also was very athletic, and I think my high school experience and middle school was all about like athletics and academics. But I also was a very creative person. I got very into fashion, very into thrifting once I learned about sustainability and environmentalism towards the end of my high school. And I actually had a fashion blog in high school, which is so funny. You know, when you're bored in the suburbs, there's not much to do. It wasn't like I lived in New York City and I had access to a ton in Minnesota. So I thought like, I'm gonna go thrifting and document my outfits as if this is gonna get me anywhere. You know, there weren't real influencers back in 2016. There were like fashion bloggers and maybe like makeup YouTubers, but it wasn't as accessible as it is now. So that wasn't even the back of my head of like, I'm gonna be an influencer one day, um, which I'll get into later in the video of kind of how I got there. When I was in about eighth or ninth grade, volleyball recruiting starts, at least for top level division one school. I'm about six feet tall, which no one believes on the internet. Why would I lie about that? Um, you also can look at my NYU volleyball roster and I'm six feet tall. Um, <laughs> but recruiting, since I was tall, I got my first recruiting offer from Penn State, top division one school in the Big Ten, when I was in eighth grade. And the recruiting process snowballed from there, started getting different levels of schools. Went in my first college visit as a freshman because yeah, I knew I wanted to play volleyball into college. But at the same time, I knew I really prioritized academics. So my mom played at University of Nebraska. She was a full-time jock, all-American. She played professionally as a coach to this day. And it's funny because growing up, I knew I always wanted to do that into college subconsciously was like always playing volleyball. So obviously my mom impacted me, impacted me is that she kind of told my sister and I go to school and then play sports second, which was very different than her experience because she was going to school for volleyball. When you're a division one athlete, you miss a lot of classes. You don't get the full college experience because you're there to perform versus if you choose division three or something else like that, you get more of an academic balance. In terms of career, at least for women athletics, there's very few opportunities to use sports as your job post-college. If you're a guy, at least you could be in the NHL, you could be in the NBA, but for women, there aren't that many opportunities. So when my mom is raising us, she definitely told us to focus on academics and make sure you're getting your college degree, which I really respected about my mom. I never felt the pressure of I had to go to the best volleyball school and only do volleyball. And so once I got into high school and realized that school was really important to me, I started to kind of pivot my college search to look at top academic schools in the country and sort of 
viewing volleyball as a thing that I can do at the schools that are my dream schools. When I was in the end part of high school and it was kind of that decision of like, what do you think you want to study in college? The subjects that I excelled in were always history, US government. I was very passionate about politics. When I was in high school, I was protesting. I was working with like gnarl pro-choice at age 16, environmental groups. This poster back here that people always ask me about is actually something from a protest in Minneapolis that my friend and I went to. So I was always interested in that. As I mentioned earlier, I was very interested in fashion from a sustainability angle, realizing that it's one of the ways that we can curb climate change is through, I'm not going to say choices because individual choice is a thing that I've reflected a lot on, but it is something we all have to wear clothes every single day, just like we have to eat food every single day. So it is a part of the climate change conversation that I felt passionate about changing and working on. I either want to go into fashion and do something sustainability. I was really into what was going on in New York. Like I would watch all of the fashion shows and watch the street style blogs. I would read all of the stuff. And I really glamorized New York, obviously, when I was little. Um, I thought it, you know, fashion capital of America, amazing. And then at the same time, in school academically, I was a really smart, sharp politics kid, very articulate, did model UN like a fucking nerd. And I thought there was an opportunity for me to work in politics one day. At this crossroads in high school when I had to sort of think about where I want to go academically because one, I wanted to find a school for volleyball. Two, I wanted to find a school that I would be happy about if I tore my ACL the first week of college, which I think is really important if you're a recruit for college. Think about if the sport was taken away from you, would you still be happy at that school? And then three, my academic stuff, I was like, what if I go to Parsons, the new school, but they don't have athletics. I, maybe they do, I don't actually know. But if I go to a school that's like a fashion arts school, they're not gonna have good sports. But I wanna do that, but maybe, maybe I wanna do politics. And so it was really difficult for me to find the perfect school. I ended up getting recruited by NYU and it's division three. So that means there's no athletic scholarship. All of my scholarship was academic for NYU. I found this school called the Gallatin School of Individualized Study, which is a meme in itself, if you know anything about it. And you get to declare and make your own major all throughout college. There's very few course requirements. You don't have to declare anything until your senior year. You have to do little checkups of writing along the way of what you think you're gonna do. And there's a lot of advising and counseling throughout the academic process. But then your senior year, you have to present what's called a colloquium. It's a essentially a thesis, kind of wrapping up, what did I do in these four years? What do I want to do with my degree? And you have to come up with a little title for it. So I applied to the school. I think I wrote my college letter about sustainability and how I had these interests in both fashion and politics, but I really saw the intersections between that. I got into NYU. I, it was really strange because because of this recruiting process, I had to tell coaches during my sophomore year of high school what my ACT score was. So I had this earlier timeline for the college process. I knew all of my friends were stressing about decisions the senior year, and I declare I committed to NYU my junior year spring. So it wasn't to say that I didn't have that stress, but mine was just earlier. Mine was I was crying my eyes out every single day of sophomore and junior year because of the academic and athletic pressure. But then senior year, I was committed and I was chilling when all my friends were worried about early decisions one, two, and application stuff. I'm moving to New York, this is crazy. I know any people from my high school that were moving to New York. I didn't know anyone in New York. I slowly started to know the girls in the volleyball team and that was my only social connection to New York. Where this video could turn into like a fucking 50 minute video. So I'm gonna try to be short with it. In high school, I did a lot of volunteer work. I was a volleyball coach, a lot of captains of different clubs, obviously volleyball, varsity captain some arts clubs, Model UN. Uniquely enough, my senior year, I was on Instagram, but in a way where I wasn't a public figure. I learned from this one girl that I happened to follow that she became a Glossier rep. And I DM'd her and I was like, what is this Glossier rep? I love Glossier. Once again, don't know how I found out about Glossier in my suburb in Minnesota in 2016. I think it was through Tumblr. But this girl said she was a Glossier rep. I asked her how she got one. She sent me a link to apply. I was somehow accepted. I had nothing, I had a little fashion blog. Somehow they accepted me in, a, in under a thousand followers on Instagram. It was very early in the Glossier heyday. I applied for this thing, which is the first post to my Instagram right now for the magazine Man Repeller, which is toxic and problematic and has its whole things. If you want a podcast about Man Repeller, there's one called The Cutting Room Podcast that interviews Leandro Medine, who's the founder of Man Repeller and gets into a lot of the issues with the company. But at the time in 2016, I applied to be a teen columnist because they wanted to diversify the age of their publication and they realized no teens really read Man Repeller, except for me. Somehow I found out about it. So my senior year of high school, I became a teen columnist for Man Repeller. I was one of the five people, and I got to write an article about Hillary Clinton, which was like right before Trump won. I wrote an article about sustainability. I wrote an article about fashion, and it was a really cool, exciting thing. I was like telling my friends, I'm like, guys, I'm writing for Man Repeller, and everyone was like, don't know what that is, Kate. 
and I'm like, well, I'm going to New York next year, so whatever. So those two things I had like on my resume, I guess, were the first kind of glimpses I had into my New York life. So I moved to New York, I start playing volleyball, I moved there in August because it's a fall sport, so I had to get here early. I immediately start looking for jobs and internships. I take a fashion internship, somehow they took me, I think they saw Manor Pellet Glossier and those were two names on the resume, I said, sure. Mary Messer Zade is a New York City based fashion designer. She has a brand in the Lower East Side and I was a production intern. I remember I told my parents like, guys, I got a fashion internship and my mom's like, you don't even know what North and South is in New York yet. You are playing college volleyball, you're going to NYU, a very academic school, and you took an internship. Looking back in the time, I don't know how I had enough hours in the day to do all of that. Crazy. But I was just so giddy excited about my life in New York, and it was a really cool opportunity. I had that internship for my first year of college when I was playing volleyball and sort of figuring out what I wanted to study. I would say all throughout college, my whole academic stuff was focused on more of the politics, environmental stuff than the fashion stuff. NYU doesn't have that many fashion classes besides design stuff. There are some theoretical fashion classes, which I did take and I did enjoy. My course load all throughout college was very random as you can imagine. I took law classes and then I took environmental classes and then I took business. There was no requirements. I took First Amendment law, then I took journalism and it was a great time. I really loved my time at Gallatin, even though it is a quirky, weird school. I think I made the most of it and it was a really good school for a person like me where I had all of these weird interests. The reason why I wanted to live in New York is because a lot of people have to come to New York over the summer to get like the summer internship and I could do that while I was in school. So while I was in college, I was taking internships and building up my resume, as I said, as a freshman in college, which I think was the biggest benefit that I had from being at NYU, besides getting the degree and all of that stuff. Babysat for a little bit, which was funny. I forget about that all the time. Come back my sophomore year and I'm like, fuck it. I want to do politics. Like I, I worked the fashion muscle. I didn't really love the side of fashion I was on. It was a lot of boring Excel stuff. I didn't really get like the sustainability, like creative side that I was interested in. So then I took an internship at the National Organization for Women, a feminist nonprofit that's been around. It was great. And it's funny because I say, I don't know how I became an influencer, a social media person, but every single job that I've had in the past, I've gotten pigeonholed into doing the social media by nature of being the youngest person in the office. So when I was at Now NYC, I was responsible for the Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the emails, the mailers, deciding which articles about reproductive rights to post, how to get the legislation in like a fun way as an infographic on our Instagram. So I was doing that. And I remember at the time I wanted to be like a policy policy intern, but I got the job to be a social media intern and I was like, the fuck social media is fake. I want to do like the hard, like smart legal stuff. And looking back now, that's very funny. At the time I minimized my intellect of like social media is a fluffy thing that is for people that don't have brains, which is obviously not true. I was looking for jobs into my junior year. I was really screwed and confused about finding a new job. Um, I was interested in working at Planned Parenthood. I was going to move to DC. And then I met, this is a funny story. I met my future boss at a party. She was a former Glossier alum. I knew she left Glossier in 2016 after Trump won the election to start something in politics and digital media, but I had no idea what she was doing. I just knew she was a Glossier alum. I somehow ended up at a party with a friend and I saw this woman, Morgan. Morgan, if you're watching this, you're probably not, but hey. Um, I went up to Morgan. I was 20 years old. She had no idea who I was. She was a Glossier Teen Vogue alum. Um, and I went up to her at this party and I said, hey, I know you left Glossier. My name's Kate. I'm a politics kid at NYU. Like, I'm looking for summer internships. I don't even know if you're hiring. I don't even know what you're working on, but I would love to work for you. She was like, DM me in the morning and let's get brunch. We got brunch. She told me what she was working on and she asked what I was getting paid at my other internship and said, I'll pay you more. Come work for me. So I worked at a government tech startup called Suprasystem. Morgan's intention of Suprasystem was to make government processes a lot easier and a lot sexier and more accessible for people, thinking about how easy it is for us to use things like Instagram, but to access something like the DMV or changing your name on your passport, those things are still very archaic. Also took two retail jobs. I worked retail at Outdoor Voices, which a lot of people don't know because I've been an OV girly since 2018. I worked at the Soho store for a year on the weekends. It was great. And then I also worked at Cat Beauty, which now doesn't have a physical location, it's only online, but it's a green beauty, health and wellness retail location. And then the other half of the store has estheticians and you can go and get facials and different treatments there. So I took two retail jobs in addition to this full-time research assistant position for Morgan. And I was at NYU. I quit playing volleyball right before my junior year of college. So right before this year started because I couldn't do all of it. And I'm not gonna get into volleyball stuff on the internet. That's just something I like to keep private, but basically it just wasn't working for me and sort of what I wanted to do in New York City and the life I had and kind of fell out of love with the sport for a few reasons. So I quit playing college volleyball August before my junior year, had these three things, felt so passionate about being in New York and kind of creating this life for myself. 
my junior year of college rolls around, it is 2020 in the spring, pandemic hits. I get laid off from the internship, obviously retail closes down, so that's kind of done, and I'm unemployed, and I'm a junior in college right before my senior year when the pandemic hit. I stay in New York City all throughout the pandemic. Dad actually had a heart attack the first week of the pandemic, and so I didn't go home for multiple reasons. It wasn't clear what was going on medically. New York City was very crazy. I had this fear of killing my parents if I came home and somehow had coronavirus and didn't know. There wasn't testing, there wasn't anything at the time. And I stayed in New York in a three bedroom all by myself, and my two roommates had left for their spring breaks at Parsons. So I was alone in New York from March of 2020 to August of 2020 until now. I just switched apartments in August 2020. And it was a lot. Um, it was tough. I don't, I feel like I blacked out a lot of it as a lot of people did to the pandemic. My dad was okay from the heart attack, but it was really scary not being there during it and also not being able to go there during it. And also him being in the hospital when coronavirus was happening. Yeah, so then all throughout the pandemic, I guess backtrack, oh my god, I feel like I have to do so many loops. All throughout college, since I had this fashion blog in high school, I sort of converted it to being a newsletter about politics. I had a few friends that knew that I was really nerdy. I was really, really nerdy about like the Senate filibuster and partisan gerrymandering. If you've been following me for like four plus years, you know all this shit. But when I was in college and studying all this stuff, I would literally go on rants about Bernie Sanders to my friends. They're kind of like, Kate, I don't really know what you're talking about. I was really interested in writing and I thought, let's make a newsletter to make politics really easy so I can explain what this Supreme Court case means to my friends or there's an election, what should I do on the ballot? Or college writing a political newsletter that I just did for fun. But that became something that I learned really translated into social media. And when the pandemic hit, of course I was tuckered in home alone. I started writing a lot about what was going on with coronavirus, the intersections between racism, classism, kind of the backlash. Once the Black Lives Matter protests started, I was like amplifying resources through my newsletter on there. Very actively involved in the protests here and went for 30 days straight. Great to see people organize. During the pandemic, everyone was being very safe, but we were all tuckered in. You didn't see anyone for a long time. So to see people out fighting for a cause all together was very inspiring. It felt like the world was literally going to shit. My first introduction into influencing, we shall say, was when I was unemployed, doing the politics stuff on my Instagram. At some point I had amassed like 10,000 followers or something like that. And I only remember that because you only had the swipe up links if you hit 10K. And I was like, I need the swipe up links because I'm sharing so many political articles, but no one's reading them because I don't have links. So I do remember when I first started influencing, I had the swipe up links, which now everyone has. I first started getting reached out to by brands when the 2020 election was happening. In your memory, there was all the absentee ballot stuff. There was the post office scandal with Trump. People were really confused about the best way to vote and how to vote and thought Trump was gonna rig the election. So there's a lot of information needed for voters. Like, what do I do during this election? I got reached out to by lifestyle, sustainability, beauty brand saying, hey Kate, we know you're a politics student at NYU. You're really good at making information accessible. We'd love you to do a little Instagram story takeover explaining how to vote an absentee ballot in Texas. And I was like, okay, I'm already doing this in my newsletter. Like, this is so funny that a beauty brand would value that and want that and want me to do that, right? Like, I was of course stoked because I already was doing that in my newsletter. And I was like, oh my God, these brands want me to do it. And I scrolled to the bottom of the email and it was like, and we'll pay you X. And this was 2020 in the fall. I was like, oh, there's money in social media. This, va this, this thing that I'm doing has inherent value. I'm getting fucking lowballed at the beginning because I didn't know what I was doing. I had no followers, whatever. I didn't view it as being a career. I was just like, oh, I can make $200 talking about gerrymandering. That's so cool because I was doing that for free for four years. I didn't realize people would pay for this content, you know? Pushed my graduation at NYU early because I had AP credits. So I graduated three and a half years, December of 2020. So I started doing a little bit of the influencing. I was graduating college and I was so stressed out of my mind. I was graduating online over Zoom. I presented my fancy thesis. My fancy colloquium title at Gallatin was political power building, environmental justice, and pre-law, something like that. My sort of thesis question was where does power in politics come from? I focused a lot on that during my academic studies, studying protest movements, studying legislation, mobilization, how that all impacts outcomes. I was obviously fixated on the climate crisis and really thinking, how can we fucking solve climate change when our politicians don't do anything? Is it about, should we protest more or should we all run for office or should we boycott this or should we vote better with our dollar? I was exploring all those questions of like, how can we actually do the whole climate change thing? When we have money in politics, we have lobbying, we have bought off politicians, the system, the electoral college is fucked up. Like, how are we gonna actually solve this thing? We are on a, a very dramatic timeline with climate. 
And so I think my question was an open-ended thing that really was forcing me to think about what I wanted to do in the world. Do I want to run for office one day or do working from the outside in politics or do I actually want to run for office or go to law school one day? So I had that question on my on my plate in December of 2020 when I first started applying to jobs. I applied to over 60 jobs. I had a, nearly a 4.0 at NYU and I got around 60 applications for jobs and I heard back from two, got one interview. I was obviously disgruntled and dissatisfied and I kind of had to make a name for myself. I thought, I have the social media thing. Why don't I just run with that while I still am unemployed? I ended up DMing my future boss when I worked in climate journalism after graduating college. I worked for a weather and climate news publication called Currently, focusing on connecting stories of local weather to climate change. Because a lot of times when a heat wave happens, people don't think about the broader climate stuff. So we were trying to make climate stories a lot more accessible and tangible to people. I never met my boss or anything like that or the team. It was all remote and it was part-time as well. So I could still do the social media thing. At that point, I thought, fuck it, I'm gonna go to law school. You might be thinking, Kate, you are doing too many things at once. And trust me, I know, I know my mental health suffered. In December of 2020, my best friend Emma and I also decide we should start a podcast about health and wellness. So I was doing those four things. I was working in climate journalism, CMOS Girlies had started. I was doing my own social media stuff in a very, very micro way. And I was applying to law school. That was my life. That was my hellish life for about eight months. Doing all those things felt like a chicken with my head cut off for that time period after I graduated. CMOS really started because Emma and I were walking around on Thanksgiving when we couldn't go home to visit our families in New York. And we thought, we listen to these health podcasts run by these old doctors. There's really no one young in the wellness space. We should do it and like explain this whole wellness thing to like people our age and why they should care at a young age because wellness is oftentimes thought about at end of life. People don't often think about doing that stuff until you are hit with a health issue. So somehow we decided to make a meme page because Emma and I have very similar humor. We thought, oh, let's just like make some memes for ourselves about our little wellness jokes. We started a podcast through the app Anchor, which is like free to use and you can monetize from day one and do all this stuff. So it was no, it was no cost on our end to start a podcast. Now, we just posted it on our socials. I had a little bit of a following. Very few people started to listen to it, but the meme page started getting shared. And I remember we were very confused and frustrated because we wanted the podcast to be the shiny thing because we put effort into like researching all the episodes and formatting and editing and all that stuff. And the memes were such low hanging fruit, but people loved them. People started giggling about ashwagandha and the gut microbiome. And we didn't really think we had an audience or a demographic that was there. So we started CMOS Girlies, that's all to say. It started to change a little bit in the spring and summer of 2021 for me. Spring it changed because I got approached by a former Glossier alum I worked with named Kim. Hi Kim, if you're watching. She worked at an app that was just starting called Geneva. And Geneva was a community app platform that different groups could be onboarded to, to engage with their community. Whether it's like a church group that needs a big group chat or a podcast that wants to interact with their listeners. She asked me actually at the time when I was writing this political newsletter, do you want to go on Geneva for your newsletter called Gen Z Gov? And at the time I said, you know what? I don't really think so, but I think there's an opportunity for this new little podcast my friend Emma and I started to maybe have a little group chat about health and wellness and learn who are these people that are liking our memes. Because people were genuinely, in the first stage of CMOS Girlies, people were in the comment section, like, oh my gosh, which magnesium do you use? Which, do you live here? Whatever. And Emma and I were so curious, like, how did these people find the meme page and who are they? I want to be friends with them. Like, I want to learn about their health and wellness stories and which, which nut butter is their favorite and what probiotic they love too. So we got onboarded onto Geneva, I think in April or March of 2021, got 400 downloads overnight. We started, we seriously were like, this is amazing. We have all these young people into health and wellness. We're learning about where they're from on their health journey, which wellness routines they love to do. And it was so rewarding for us to kind of create this little niche community on the internet. CMOS really started to be a lot more tangible to us as soon as we got into Geneva. In the summer of 2021, another big thing happened for me, and that was I got onto TikTok. Very hesitant in 2020 to ever get on TikTok. I had the stigmas that this is just a dancing app for teenagers. All my friends were saying, get on it, Kate, you do great on the platform. And I was like, this doesn't seem like for me, guys. I'm not gonna be twerking on the internet. I I ripped off the band-aid. I had no idea what TikTok was. I downloaded it. I started filming videos and it was very clunky and awkward. I didn't really know how to use the app. 
my first few videos were like, I'm going on a run, I'm wearing my hokas and my outdoor voices leggings. And then I would run and sprint off. There are videos of me city biking around like a maniac. The algorithm obviously prioritizes different things and I don't know why the algorithm loved me in that summer, but I gained like 20,000 followers in the first two months of being on the app for my really low brow, dumb, goofy content of my life. I'm not gonna say dumb, but it was just low lift content and I was not strategic at all of like what I was posting. I think now you're on TikTok, like you see people following the formula of how to become a micro influencer and how to be a TikToker. Like get ready with me to go to my dad's funeral. Like get ready with me to go rob a bank. That wasn't the thing at the time. I was not following a formula. I genuinely was just clicking record when I was jump roping on the West Side Highway and was confused why people were commenting stuff. I got into TikTok, immediately started doing very well. And I was still not thinking I'm gonna monetize this. I'm gonna make this a business one day. But something happened with a brand that you guys know and love called Hoka. So of course I've run in Hoka. I've been loyal for five years ever since I started running. I got my first pair of Hoka's when I worked at the Outdoor Voices store. I needed a pair of running shoes when I quit playing volleyball and they sold Hoka's and I thought, okay, let's give these a try. Worked for me great, loved running ever since. So in all my early, early TikTok videos that were workout videos, I wore Hoka's and oftentimes the comment section was like, what are these shoes you're wearing? And I would reply back. Then the next video I'd post, someone would comment like, I bought Hoka's cause of you, which is a comment I still get to this day, which is very wholesome and cute because when I do this reflection, I remember that's how I started just organically posting about it and people resonating with it which is amazing that's still a comment that I get all the time so that happened I somehow get an email or a dm from Hoka themselves it's like hey Kate we've seen your tiktoks they weren't really like I think at the time Hoka really hadn't had a platform on tiktok or wasn't really investing resources there I said hey we saw you have a tiktok we'd love to send you a pair of shoes to post in your next video I remember I read the email and was like, guys, Hoka's sending me a pair of shoes. What the fuck? And of course it wasn't paid. I wasn't even like, oh my God, I'm gonna be a Hoka athlete. I didn't even know that was a thing at the time. I was just like, I'm just getting a free pair of Hoka's. What the hell, this is amazing. So I still did my usual spiel just wearing the Hoka's, but it was very interesting and genuine. I think it's why I've had success on TikTok and Instagram is because I remember when I posted the video in all of my new Hoka gear and the shoes and people commented like, oh my God, you're getting the bag, bestie. Like that Hoka is sending you stuff and you were talking about them and now you're getting them. I love to see the character arc. Right? People love to root for the underdog and the fact that I was just a girly posting about the Hokas and then they saw me and realized that I had inherent influence and value, people love to see it. So I started posting about Hoka. One small video then turned into them reaching out and saying, hey, we wanna pay you to do a video. I was like, they're gonna pay me? And then it was like, hey, we want you to do four videos. We want you to be our TikTok girl of the summer in August. I made four TikTok videos with them. And I remember I was so nervous about like every little thing I sent to them because I was like, this is Hoka, this is so serious. Like it has to look perfect. The lighting has to look perfect. Like what do I have to do? And they of course loved the content and it did really well. So of course I started to do more and more with Hoka. And at the time I was still doing this like whole law school arc where I was on TikTok a little bit and kind of documenting like I'm applying to law school. I took the LSAT in two months, wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend you study for more than two months because you can't learn all that information. I took it in October of 2021. I got to press send in my law school applications. I had all my letter of recs lined up in November. And I go to law school for public interest law, environmental litigation, really focusing on organizations like Earth Justice and just fighting the climate crisis through litigation. A case called Juliana v. US, focus on making climate change a constitutional right that the government can't deprive its future citizens of, i.e. children in the next generation. So basically like polluting the earth is depriving people of their human rights. That thing hasn't made it up to the Supreme Court level yet, but that sort of litigation is what I'd be really passionate about working on. And law school's not like a no thing for me. It's just like a not now thing for me. I forget that people go to law school when they are not 23 fresh out of college. So it was November, I was home for Thanksgiving. I was doing really well on TikTok and starting to make a sufficient amount of income off of TikTok. Even though I still had like under 100K Instagram, I still was like under 20K. I was really good at working the brand connections. I had a lot of organic brand connections because the way I was speaking about product they're all throughout college of like, hey guys, I take Ritual multivitamin. Ritual wasn't paying me to say that, but I just like took it and people were curious about what multivitamin I took. And then Ritual was like, oh my God, you love our product. We'd love to work with you. Same thing happened with Seed. Same thing happened with Moon Juice. Same thing happened with Athletic Greens. Could I do this full time? I was home for Thanksgiving with my family in Minnesota with my parents in their bedroom. They're like, how's the law school stuff? And I just broke down I said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And they said, don't do that then. Don't go. I was so scared about what saying no to law school would mean. And my mom's like, yeah, you need to pick one thing. You're kind of like a chicken with your head cut off doing podcasts, doing law school, doing this. You need to quit your climate journalism job too, Kate. You need to do that too. 
So I quit that and I quit law school because I thought those things will always be there for me. I have my college degree. I can always go back and do those things. But this new TikTok thing, Hoka thing, this is very new and rare. And I think I would always regret it if I didn't go down that path. And I'm so glad that I went down that path, not only for the life that I have now and genuinely feel like I'm living out the life that I want, but I would have always regretted it. I think if I was in law school right now, like what would have happened if I said yes to TikTok and gone all in on it. I remember I posted something on Instagram because Instagram is sort of a LinkedIn for me where brands follow me, social media managers follow me. And I said, hey, I decided I'm not going to law school, quit climate journalism, and I'm gonna go full-time on social media. I have no idea what the future holds and no idea what's gonna happen, but I'm gonna do it. I had a lot of hesitations to go full-time on social media. One, the instability of the career. What if people find me unlikable tomorrow and I have no income? Two, it's inherently risky platforms getting deleted, i.e. TikTok now, or just what if a brand wants to go another way and not work with you? Three, you're a freelancer. The income is very random and scarce. And also Instagram and TikTok don't really have established rates for stuff versus like being a photographer. It's kind of, it's a lot more clear of like what you can charge. TikTok's a new beast. Some micro influences are charging like thousands of dollars for a 15 second video because the platform is so new that brands don't know how to really interact with it. So I had a lot of qualms about it, but I felt like I had a network of brands, probably 20 plus brands that I had worked with that I could email saying, hey, do you have opportunity for a paid thing coming up if I needed to? I felt like I had enough stuff on my future horizon that I was comfortable with financially, that I didn't have to do much outreach. And to this day, somehow bless think enough, I don't have to do a lot of outreach to brands. I often get 90% stuff into my inbox and do probably like 10% outreach to brands. I've been very blessed in that capacity with socials. So I went full time on social media. I get an email from Supergoop the week later saying, hey, we'd love to work with you on a long-term partnership. And I was like, what? This is crazy. This is already happening. In January, I get an email from Hoka saying, hey, Kate, uh, we really have loved working with you and we would love to sign you on to our global athlete ambassador program. And I remember when I read the email, I thought it got sent to the wrong inbox. I've never run a marathon. I'm not that fast. Are you sure? This is for me. Got on a call with them and they said, you are one of our best performing people we've worked with on socials. You have a great way of talking about product naturally. People relate to you, you influence people. Then they offered me this yearly contract, which I'm on, and I've re-signed my contract with Hoka as of April 1st of 2023, which is really exciting. You're too Hoka girl, baby. Because I had this period of doubt about what the future was gonna be and it ended up working out. And not to say that things always work out. There's definitely stuff that doesn't work out. Like I'm not a full manifestation girly. Started working full time with Supergoop Hoka as my main two kind of yearly contracts. Now I'm on contract with companies like Hyperice, Athletic Greens. It's been really beautiful. Um, it's been really exciting, I think, to take a chance on myself and have this life in front of me now. For a long time, I didn't think social media was a real job. I thought it was a fake thing that idiots did. And once I got rid of those stigmas and realized that it is a value and I have that value and I'm good at it, I'm good at being on Instagram all day, I guess, I really tapped into it. And I take it very seriously from like a business perspective. I'm incorporated as an S-Corp for tax reasons. I do all of my own stuff. I don't have any management. I send my invoices. I brief content, I pitch, I do all of that stuff in terms of brand partnerships. So I really like it. I love being my own boss. I never thought I'd be my own boss at age 24. I don't view social media influencing as a forever thing. If I'm posting selfies and I'm 45, probably not there's something going on there ask if I'm okay at that point but it has been a beautiful jumping off point of really harvesting into my skills and realizing what I'm good at when I graduated college and I applied to jobs I did not put on my job application that I had a political newsletter for four years or that I did social media stuff because I didn't view that as a skill or a talent my dad asked me something about applications and he's like why aren't you talking about that and I thought the dean of harvard law is not going to fucking care that I was a glossier rep in social media for almost two years now, I can talk so much more confidently about myself. So that's where I am now. See my scrollies, podcast, meme page, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, YouTube. And I'm genuinely grateful for trusting myself and starting to believe in myself and show up. It's only made my life a lot better. I had perfectionism and self-doubt ruin a lot of my high school years and early college years. See how like corny emotional I am, but I do a lot of journaling and reflection all the fucking time to have that dialogue with myself. And it's really made me a better person. So I think that's where I am now. 
Now I'm gonna get into your guys' questions. Favorite way to spend a Saturday night? Well, I've been going out more. So I actually do like going out. I think I never got into drinking, so I didn't like that. Now you guys know I'm on my weed edible journey. So I like being a little bit high and dancing, but I also go to bed at 9 p.m. throughout the week and I am very comfortable, happy spending a Saturday night in my Normatec recovery boots, drinking magnesium, going to bed. So I can do either, but I've been trying to treat myself to going out more and realizing I don't have to be a hermit crab unless I want to. Travel plans, I don't have any. I'm trying to dream bigger. And I've been thinking about what if I hosted my run club in different cities? Cause I know people that follow me live everywhere and I would be so pumped to like go to LA and host a run club and do that thing. So those are some travel plans. If I'm able to race Big Sur in April, I will be going there on April 30th. Probably you're gonna have to pull out of that. So those are my only travel plans. What's your favorite place in Minnesota besides home? This is open-ended. I love hanging out around the lakes. Hunt and Gather is a thrift store. I was obviously on my thrift store vintage store beat back there. So I love like uptown around like Lake Harriet area. I have a lot of nostalgic memories there. Favorite go-to quick meals. I love a yogurt bowl. I love a mackerel salad. I honestly, all my meals are quick cause I'm very, I get very hangry and so I like making very quick meals. I love a dessert potato. If you don't know what that is, that's a sea musk really thing. It's a Japanese sweet potato that you put sweet toppings on. Yeah. When I get into wellness was a long wonky thing of like healing my eating disorder. I think I'm gonna make a whole video about wellness, but I definitely learned a lot from working at Cat Beauty. I learned a lot about different brands and kind of the wellness space professionally. Um, also self-discovery, I was vegan, which I'm gonna make a video about, and so I had to tar start taking supplements because I knew I was deficient in things like B12 and vitamin D. Favorite distance to run? Five miles is like my favorite distance because it's not too long, it's long enough, you, s you feel a good burn, but you're not exhausted and hangry and pissy the next day. Favorite places to go in NYC? A lot of these questions are me just saying, I'm gonna make a separate video about this, but I wanna make a video of like taking you to my favorite places in New York City. So I will do that. How am I doing injury wise? My knee is healed. Now my calf just feels like it has rocks in it because it hasn't been working, but I'm going to PT twice a week and we're, we're getting back. See so Muscarly merch is not dropping. I will be dropping Run Club merch very soon. Um, it's zero waste sustainable merch that I've been working on kind of in private for a little bit, but it'll be coming out, I think in like early spring, summer. My love for baby Keem come from, um, I just truly listened to him one day and was like the cadence of the way he raps and how he raps and his confidence. Like this is how I feel when I'm running and baby Keem is my husband. It's 2023, are dating apps out? Please say yes and why. Well, I'm currently dating someone, um, did not meet on a dating app. So dating apps are out, I guess. The last question I got was a piece of advice or a mantra you live by. The advice that I really live by is to honor the ebbs and flows in your life. Do not get fixated on a future linear path. I think the greatest things are the things that I didn't expect it, the opportunities or the people in my life. Every time that I've been fixated on, I'm gonna go to law school, I'm gonna go to this college or do this one thing, I have been focusing way too much on the future and not living in the present or harping on the past. Why didn't this thing happen to me? Now I've screwed up my future. When you're living in the present, you're taking it day by day. And I genuinely live like that now. I really try to trust the timing of my life. I would say that's a mantra I live by. It sucks when bad things happen. And that's not to say when traumatic things happen, you deserve them. That's another thing that I hate about the whole manifestation thing. Why did my dad have a heart attack? Like he didn't manifest that. So what I mean about trusting the timing is really honoring what happens to you. It's a redirection. How can you learn from it? Control haunts me in ways that I had an issue with it in the past. To control my future, wanting to control how I look. And if we, if someone came to you right now and said, here's what your next 60 years of your life are gonna look like, I don't think life would be that fun. The uncontrollable is the exciting stuff. That's where life happens. Comfortable with the uncertainty of life. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was really fun to make and I will see you in the next one. Bye.